Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks again for joining us here in uh, the University of Galway at the Rural Voices Seminar Series. I think this is our 13th um, series. Uh, uh, so it's great to be with you today. It's great for the regular people who join us and anybody new who is with us. And um, thanks a lot for coming along. It's uh, great to have you. And uh, I suppose as many of you who have joined us previously will know we are doing this event in conjunction with the Department of Rural and Community Development. So um, every month we put on a seminar related to rural research or rural practice on the ground, uh, I suppose an area of interest to all of us involved in this. So again, thank you all for coming. And for today, I want to welcome, uh, I suppose Shane is no, Shane Conway is no, uh, he's not, um, it's familiar to all of us because he works with us here in the University of Galway and we have, I suppose, um, worked with Shane over a number of years here in Galway and Shane did his PhD in Galway um, related to issues in and around succession and inheritance and since then Shane has worked extensively with us on the National Rural Network Project and is now also coordinating a project, a premier Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe project here at the moment in relation to the multi-actor approach. So it's great to have Shane with us today on the other side of the camera um, presenting his own um, take on his own research and I suppose a very practiced piece of work that has happened over the last number of weeks on the ground, the Farmers Yards project. So I'm delighted to have Shane with us today. And I'm also delighted to have Neve Nolan with us, who has been assisting Shane and myself in relation to the dissemination of the Farmers Yards project over the last number of weeks. So it's good to have Neve with us as well, who's working with us at the moment as well in the University of Galway. So good to have Neve with us. So Shane, I'm going to hand over to you. I think you have access to share your presentation. So we'll sit back and listen to Shane for a while. And again, as always, if you have some questions, please pop them into the chat and myself and Neve will facilitate these questions as we move along. So please, yes, pop them into the chat as we go along. So Shane, I'll hand over to you. Okay. Thanks so much, Maura, for the introduction and uh, delighted to speak to you all today. Um, hard to believe we're on to the 13th uh, session already in this Rural Voice the Seminar series. So yeah, it's the first time uh, us, as in Galway, are presenting some of our own work. So, uh, you know, as time goes on, we'll present more of our work. But um, yeah, so today um, I'm going to speak predominantly about this Farmers Yards new social initiative for the farming community um, project I've been working on. Um, but, you know, this journey started 10 years ago, back in 2013, when I started my PhD. And this was the, the foundations were built for this. Uh, you know, this wasn't just something that was developed and devised and created. Um, over the past year or two, it was it was uh, there was a lot of research behind it. So just to give a little bit of background, the first few slides, I'll, I'll basically try and synopsize 10 years of research in a few slides. So so, you know, the, the, the bones of the issue essentially is that a third of European farmers, Irish farmers are above the uh, normal retirement age of 65, uh, generally speaking. And also, I just wanted to give an example from the US that's uh, a third as well in the US. So, you know, to really break that down and take a step back and to look at it, that does raise concerns about the future competitiveness of the farming sector. And more importantly, the guaranteed food production in the coming decades. You know, the world population is rising, it's increasing, but yet the farming, farming population is aging. So, you know, it, it's something that needs to be looked at. When we look at the age profile of farmers by county in Ireland, as you can see in the more uh, peripheral regions, uh, the age, it's, a, it's a, an older um, demographic. I suppose when you look towards, say, Cork, for example, or, or Wexford, um, it's uh, slightly younger. That's predominantly probably because the farms are a bit bigger, uh, more dairy industry probably relates to income. But generally speaking, that's the way it's broken down. Um, but, you know, there's there's lots of perspectives to look at this and you can see even in the news today Mocker and the firm are, are marching towards Dublin uh, to, to you know, advocate for the younger farmer and um, rural Ireland um, and, that, and that's essential there's lots of research in that as well but you know specifically especially back 10 years ago 
there wasn't any real um you know emphasis placed in the older generation it was basically well it's time for them to retire it's time for them to step aside and this uh you know this reluctance to step aside and retire was is globally recognized and in research it had been but um there was it there was and continues to be a need to uh uh, look beyond financial enticements because they had been in place, but they weren't working. I suppose if I ever had to justify or explain why I did what I did 10 years ago, uh, it was this policy document here. So I ripped this to shreds over the past few years, and I continue to do so just to kind of showcase the vision that was there to try and in incentivize um, older farmers to, to retire. And, you know, these are quotes pulled out directly from a, a direct policy document from our Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Um, you know, lines like persons intending to retire into the scheme shall, shall cease agricultural activity forever. Continued participation in farming is not permitted and be, be between the age of 55 and 66. So I'm sure anyone that's logged in here, you know, familiar with the rural space, um, probably farming as well, it just doesn't align with the, the mindset and mannerisms of, of farmers. So this was something that was very, very um, important in, to, to, to look at, to, to really question, well, would this work? Has this worked? Why hasn't it worked? Because it only did last for a few months. So this was not looked at um, 10 years ago. So, you know, the way I, I broke that down was essentially farmers were being asked to revise their self-perceptions upon retirement. Um, it was oblivious to the mindset of older farmers, and there was a huge need to look beyond financial enticements alone, because when you go back to this, this was looking at economics. The older generation probably perceived to be not as productive, time to move them aside. But when we look at it from the social perspective, the emotional perspective, there's a big need, there was a big need to, to delve deeper. So my research you know, challenge this uh, one dimensional um, approach, i.e. the economic perspective on it. Um, so, you know, probably 10 years now, uh, kind of looking at this, uh, the older farmers mindset and mannerisms, but I want to, you know, and I have identified the various human dynamics to synopsize human dynamics, influencing and hindering the decision making processes around farm succession and retirement in later life. So that's the focus of this research. And this was the first geographical sociological study carried out on this particular topic regarding the attitudes and behavior patterns of older farmers. Um, since the late Pecky Commons, Dr. Pecky Commons, um, who used to work with Chagas, he looked at this in the 1970s. And I suppose I was lucky enough to, uh, through my literature review stage of my PhD in first year, to keep trawling through reports. And I came across this old tattered report uh, one day and it was like a, a eureka moment I, I read what he he had advocated for back then you know in the 70s he did acknowledge that there was a human element to retirement that you know policy needs to take into account but then you know jump forward 30 something years later the department of agriculture come out with a a really insensitive uh, document that didn't take into account that so i was like okay I have a lot of uh, ammunition here, I suppose, to, to, to move to drive forward with this PhD. And that, that's really how, what it's based on. You know, I won't go into all the data collection, but there was almost 900 farmers in total um, involved in the PhD in the study um, over the, the four years. And thankfully, when we say, for example, when we look at the Chagas National Land Use Farm Survey, that sample there of 236 farmers over the age of 55 for the specific purpose of this research but actually it was from a national representative sample of 44,000 farmers so this was you know this is a national sample like Chagas were they weren't I wasn't funded by Chagas I wasn't a Chagas student but through Anne Kinsella who's a senior economist in Chagas she was um you know very kindly uh, allowed me to uh, use such questions because this is for the the common good essentially and Chagas have always been very good to me in the sense of letting me publish um in their various magazines for example but I can mention that again so yeah this is the way it's broken down they held Chagas held farm uh, transfer clinics so really they're held around the country I went to every one of them uh, handed out surveys um got the the tick the box answers you know you get the the initial overview, but for such a, a sensitive topic like this, 
in relation to someone's emotions or their their attachment to their farm or their 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 perceptions or their thoughts on the future um especially in relation to farming and the, the their attachment to land uh, to take a box to uh do a survey what isn't enough and that's you know in our area of human geography or social science it's we delve deeper into these topics through interviews and and that's what i did so I was quite lucky. Um, I suppose I'm, I farm myself, and I'm um, from a farm farm background. Um, I suppose when, when I'm doing my research, my positionality is is quite important to me, and um, that farmers uh, can trust me in the sense of the you know I'm, I I have this kind of insider positionality in the sense that you know I'm all I am one of them, but I also of course I work in academia. But because of that. I found that a lot of, um, and I suppose any of you who work with farmers, you might relate to this as well, that once they knew that essentially they could trust me and that, you know, this was for their good, a lot of them did give me their contact details for a future interview. So when I did run the sample and um, pick out the names, I had, uh, you know, a really good sample of people to interview. And because the clinics were held all around the country, these transfer and the family farm clinics that Chagas held, the actual interviews were held around the country. And that, that's very important because farm Ireland, you know, with a lot of different farming systems, depends on where you are in the country, different land types, more productive areas than others. So, you know, to, to do such a study, say just in Connacht, for example, wouldn't have been sufficient. Um, you know, you might mean getting a certain type of farms. To just do it in Munster wouldn't have been sufficient. So this is a, a, an all of Ireland, uh, the Republic uh, study. Um, so, yeah. This led to the publication of these papers. Uh, four uh, were published through the PhD and then uh, three more um, afterwards since. So there's seven peer reviewed uh, publications on this specific topic around these human dynamics affecting farm succession and retirement in later life from the older generation's perspective. And going back to the very first slide, a third of our farmers are over 65. So, you know, it's it's a very significant uh, demographic of our farming population. So, like the purpose of this presentation today is more about the farmers' yards, but just to give you a, a quick synopsis on the main findings. And of a, a national sample, the main findings, a very representative sample that this reluctance and indeed resistance to alter the status quo, essentially change the existing management and ownership structure of the farm in later life and retirement is undoubtedly strong. There was a powerful um, resistance towards it. Um, the reasons were expensive, but the common denominator is that this whole farm succession, farm transfer, farm retirement uh, process is about emotion. As we know, and anecdotally had been, you know, uh, in a lot of cases, um, it was, it was, you know, just uh, quite common knowledge almost, but research hadn't really uh, looked into this, but, you know, farming is more than an economic activity. And that came to the fore and um, very, very much so in the research. So when you break that down to previous policy, human side of farming and retirement uh, is, had been overlooked. A very strong statements to come out is that the cultural expectations that farmers don't retire. And there's almost a, a badge of honor to die with your boots on. So that's what the farming community think, whereas policy, we're trying to take another approach. So there was a huge disconnect between both. Uh, you know, that's in relation to the occupation. I also, one of the papers looked at the farm, the actual farmer farm relationship in later life. So, you know, they're rooted in place, they've been there all their life. Legitimate connectedness that, well, if they're farming, they're part of the farming community. And if they were to retire, they would sort of perceive that they would be seen as almost not in the in the game anymore and a sense of nostalgia really that the farm tells the story they can almost associate the, the development of their their life or their marriage or their children's upbringing through the farm the different stages so you know i i have extensive quotes um through the um the research just said i'd pull out just two um not going to go into too much but really um asking a farmer a 67 year old mixed livestock farmer from the west um average farm size um but just asked about retirement basically in as many words cutting a farmer um adrift uh, of their farm at that stage of their life would leave them in a very lonely place um you know this was another example of a farmer from the West. 
you know, I asked him about retirement, you know, cracked a joke, can't see myself heading off to Costa Brava or the likes for the rest of my life. Uh, I find that when I go somewhere on holidays for a day with my wife, I'd be anxious to get back to the farm. I'd be really missing it, you see. I'd be out of my depth living anywhere else. So again, it's just to tie back these sentiments, these quotes back to previous retirement policy, expecting farmers to retire forever. Like what, what was next? This is what they want to do. This is what they enjoy. It's not just an occupation. So this uh, challenge of transition is overwhelming. This loss of identity, status in the uh, status in the farming community and control. And the soft issues, I was often complimented early on about, oh, it's great you're looking at the soft issues. But you know, you can turn that on its head. These whole psychodynamic and sociodynamic factors are the most difficult to deal with. No economic model or no, you know, it can, can solve this. This is actually uh, at an emotional level, it's it's quite uh, it's quite deep. So um ironically, these are the, the hard issues. Um so this this like no one can avoid aging. Um and it's important to, you know, even people that are devising policy. Um I had suggested to me before that anyone that's writing up retirement policy should be in their mid-50s to late 50s, because they can empathize with it more. But you know, it just it's something that we really need to take into account when we're devising policy that you know older farmers opt to maintain the, the facade or the image of normal day-to-day -day retirement and behavior instead of retirement. Um because the reality is that ultimately the older generation of farmers decide whether farm transfer happens or not. They hold the gold, and the gold in farming is the land. And you know, I can I will allude to it in a little while. Um, the challenges. So I, I, I want to bring in the younger generation a little bit because it is very important because we only have less than six percent under 35, but because there's such a huge percentage over 65. This is the focus here. But yeah, this disconnect between the realities on the ground, which I found through my research, that you know there needs to be this cultural sh uh, shift in thinking around policy because this language of farming that I have revealed um, is, is very important to take into account. So really uh, kind of heading towards the, the, I'm giving a lot of context here, but heading towards the topic of today's presentation, um, this whole farmer sensitive policy design and implementation. So social interventions and strategies addressing this emotional and social well-being has the potential to greatly ease the stresses of this process or essentially to assist. Uh, there's a stigma and defeatist stereotype associated with stepping back, but social innovation can try and address this, that this sense of purposefulness rather than cessation to the older farmer. Um, you know, and through the research, just an example, it was very important to me to, you know, you published an academic journal, but, you know, you don't want to be in an ivory tower of academia, you want your research to make an impact. So thankfully, through Chagas, I was lucky enough to uh, have certain um, magazines, but it was then that the media picked it up, um, be it the national media and the Farmer's Journal, for example, but most importantly, the local media. Um, and that's where the farming community read it. And that was really important. And ironically, it wasn't until it got to the media that I used to get calls from Brussels at the time, Phil Hogan's office, he was commissioner for agriculture. But if it never reached the media, it would never make an impact for policy. So it's just some, some really important uh, messages coming through from research. You know, uh, former minister, Michael Creed, uh, this was a, a previous uh, report that was published just coming towards the end of my PhD. There was an acknowledgement that in truth, many farmers don't want to retire. And I fully understand and respect that wish. But this was coming on the back of the research. Um, we need to make arrangements that work for the, both the older and the new generation. So that, you know, in 10 years, they went from must cease all agricultural activity forever to this message. So it's, you know, it's quite a quite an impact in that sense. Uh, also, MACRA, the body representing younger farmers in Ireland, um, you know, they, they, they wanted to focus aid moving away from retirement grounds but looking at more about partnerships, essentially. Um, so again, a shift in, in focus. But most importantly, and this was this uh, representative on the call who carried out this study, uh, uh, here I saw her name popping up. Um, this was a, a study carried out um, by the European Commission. It was published by the European Commission, but really a line in this was very important towards my future direction. And this was published in 2021. 
There was a call for increased mechanisms that help older farmers enhance their quality of life by exploring possibilities under social policy. So when I saw this, I was like, okay, you know, I've published all this research, but this can actually bring me to the next level. This can actually, uh, you know, give me a lot of weight. You know, at a national level, we have this narrative, but at a European level, this is the message coming out. So that's what kind of led to the, the next stage, I suppose, this creation of an age-friendly environment in farming. This was um, the, the next piece of research I took on. So I, I wanted to look at how can we develop an age-friendly environment in the farming sector. And the age-friendly environment is actually uh, the World Health Organization. That's their concept, the age-friendly environment. And they define it as one in which policies, services, settings, and structures support and enable people to age actively. Now, if there was ever anything a farmer wants to do is age actively. So it was to really to try and tie it into this in some way or another, because despite the growth of this age-friendly environment movement, um, you know, in a lot of different sectors across the world, across not just in Ireland, not just in Europe, existing uh, literature focused on the model of urban aging and fail to reflect the diversity of, of the rural uh, rural areas or particularly the farming community. So, you know, again, you're trying to just build the case as to why this is important. Indeed, agricultural policies preoccupation with encouraging older farmers to step aside and retire was at the base, base was at odds, I suppose, with the basic principles of this all aging actively. Um, the barriers to healthy aging um, I, I won't go through them all, but really going back to previous retirement policy just went against it. So, you know, this was alluded to in a paper I published in 2018 uh, as a recommendation, but now it was to, to, to basically build on the recommendation of 2018, build on the recent uh, policy directives from Europe, and then tied into this World Health Organization concept. So it was really to join the dots. And by doing so, it was, you know, I advocated that there needs to be a social organization that represents the needs and the interests of the farming community. And I'll talk about farmers' yards in a moment, but this will provide farmers with a sense of purpose and legitimate social connectedness within the farming community, peer-to-peer -peer collegiality, camaraderie, um, have activities, be it social, cultural practice, uh, suit their needs, and ease this concern about this, the fear of stepping aside and retirement from farming, that, you know, there is this social facility that there's, there's, they're going to be their peer group are going to be there. They're still involved in farming. They may have taken a step back. They may have physically not been able to do what they used to do, but they do still have this peer group. And, and at the moment, you know, you do have Mocker and a farmer that represents the needs of the uh, younger farmer. But nothing, nothing for the older. You have IFA, but they're almost, a, uh, you know, they advocate for, for, you know, socially they don't play that role. So, you know, when we talk about social group membership in later life, again, the World Health Organization are constantly saying the importance of this. But this is again from very general, not specifically about farming. But why can't farming fit in here? What, what's Farming is included here. Farming should be. So that's, um, you know, the World Health Organization can't forget about farming, the food producers of this world. Um, so, you know, this is really to try and tie it in. Um, social gerontology, we're lucky enough to have a, a centre in the university as well. Um, they do talk about social group membership in, in later life as well and the importance to one's in social inclusion, health and well-being. So, um, you know, we only need to think back very recently to the social isolation measures brought um, into effect by COVID pandemic. Um, and if anything, they have really, you know, it was almost like another layer or another proof almost that this social network and farming is so important. Um, there was a lot of elderly population of society in general, young and old, but um, it's particularly elderly and in rural areas, uh, even more isolated than, than most. Um, and the United Nations, again, I'm, I'm mentioning the World Health Organization, I'm mentioning the United Nations, but it's just to showcase that the scale of this and the potential scale of this and, and how farming is central to this, like the United Nations, the OECD, all these bodies, farming is all part of this. There's no reason why farming is not central to every uh, movement. 
Um, so, you know, they did talk about these retirement groups, um, valuable for older farmers and in, in, in well-being in difficult times. So, again, that builds the case, that tries to showcase the importance of this. And anecdotally, and being from the farming community myself, you know, when you think about social facilities, you, you, you immediately think of the livestock market sector. The fact that, you know, there are venues of transaction within the farming community, but they're also hubs of social interaction. A lot of farmers go there uh, for the social, just for the chats, just to kind of catch up with their neighbours. So you're thinking about, you know, with the research, thinking about how do you create a social facility? Well, like, you know, it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's about building on what's there already and trying to improve it. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot of farmers attend these, they, they're not selling or buying, they're there just to catch up. So that plays that role already. But anecdotally, there has been recent research again from the UK carried out about the value of these livestock auction houses. Professor Matt Lobley, who I was lucky enough to have as my extern in my, uh, extern in my PhD uh, um, examiner, he uh, has published on this topic. And um, really, it showcases in a UK perspective as well um, that the, the merits play that role. But these extracts are taken from my own papers here now. But you know, you know, I advocated and you know that farmers play this vital social facility of the farming community. Um, some may have no other social outlet or live alone. And this trip to the weekly mart is where they can meet their friends, exchange ideas, and catch up on local news in an informal setting, a friendly and informal setting where they feel safe, a safe space essentially, the mart. Um, and you know, the mart has grown that, that role that this social facility not proven to be up until now. Um, you know, it was just kind of a, a given that, well, that's what the mark plays, but there hadn't been research carried out in this or, or any initiative to kind of prove it. Um, it has grown in significance in recent years as many of the natural meeting points within rural communities, as we know, where again, we're all involved in the rural space, most of us here. A lot of these, um, be it uh, post offices or rural pubs, local shops have closed. But in a lot of cases, and I'll show you a map in a little while, the map, the marts remain central in this, these, these communities. So they continue to play this role. And there's about 60 cooperative marts across the Irish countryside. So the argument in the in the in that paper I published was that, well, we're in a position here where marts existing positionality and reputation as a as a hive of activity within the heart of rural communities provides them with a ready-made platform and network to diversify their services. So they're not just selling and buying animals, but they become they can become, and this was, I pitched this back in, you know, 20, the start of last year or the end of 2021, and um, that they can become social hubs for the farming community in their catchment area. There's no reason why not. Um, but there needs to be, you know, there needs to be an initiative that drives it forward. But for the purpose of of research, this was um this is this is the way I pitched it. And again, it's about publishing it in an academic journal, but filtering it the whole way through from policy documents to the media to the local media. And that's how you can make a real impact. So that's where leaves us with farmers' yards. Um so this is the, the logo for Farmers Yards. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, avail of some funding from the University's Innovation Office under the uh, Illuminate program. Um, they're very helpful. Um, it, it was really to uh, develop a pilot initiative around this idea. And without the, the funding from the Illuminate program, it wouldn't have been possible. So I just want to acknowledge them for that. Um, you know, I had carried out the research, I'd made an impact in policy, but actually, I brought this a step further. We actually rolled it out um, between myself and Maura and Neve, who's on the call. You know, we 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 brought this to life. Um, so this farmers' yard social organisation of the farming community pilot initiative, funded by this Illuminate program, uh, also with support of St Gerald's Credit Union in Tune, they were kindly enough to assist us in a little bit of a way. Um, but uh, yeah, it really it's about promoting 
uh, promoting uh, social inclusion and in turn well-being in the farming community by providing farmers in the area uh, with a platform to come together as a local peer group in a familiar and uh, friendly mart setting. You know, we can see the well-established men's sheds movement, the benefits of that at local level. Uh, I won't say it's always from a, a more an urban setting, but it's um, in a lot of cases, the farming community aren't engaged with it because they hold this identity that, well, we're farmers and we, we not that we always just stick together, but it's not as applicable to us. And there was that perception. So farmers yards actually is tailored towards the farming community. And we believe um, now that Farmers Yards has just as much, if not more, potential to succeed as the men's sheds, as it's gender inclusive. Farmer is a gender neutral term. This is applicable to men and women. And also there's an intergenerational aspect, inter intergenerational aspect to Farmers Yards. It's not just for the older farming population. There can be younger farmers involved as well. And it actually could bring them together somewhat, uh, even in the Mark Canteen. It, it's just a social hope for the farming farming community in its entirety. So this was, we created, uh, you know, this was the, the launch. We held it at the beginning of March. So it's literally the six week pilot only ended on Friday. Um, and Neve was, Neve Nolan, who's on the call, was the facilitator. So she drove it forward. So I just want to acknowledge Neve. Couldn't have done it without Neve. So just, uh, it's great to have her on board. This was the invitation. You know, we, we, we targeted this, um, you know, quite extensively, and it got a lot of coverage. I'll, I'll mention that in a moment where it was captured. But um, we essentially just pitched it as a, as a get together for farmers. Um, and Montpellier were the first to be chosen. Montpellier Mart again to acknowledge Montpellier Mart. They provide us with, you know, so much help. They, 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 they provide us with a free platform. They said, please just, you know, work with the farmers, see what they want. And uh, very helpful. So, yeah, we created some merchandise, some so you know some hats so you know things like that that farmers would pick up and and and, and it's about word of mouth in the farming community so we just wanted to try and um, get as many involved as possible we set it up in the mart canteen as you can see in the back right corner there was a projector set up and the mart actually what was um streamed so there's in every mart now because of COVID propelled the farming sector for 10 years in relation to online bidding. So the, the Mart was actually taking uh, place uh, online during COVID. So now it's actually a common practice. So we actually streamed the live Mart that was taking place across the way on the screen. So farmers never really missed out on um, what, the, what was going on. So actually it was, it was quite a nice uh, feature of it. And so that, that was the way it was set up, the canteen. Um, again, Montpellier Mart, just really helpful and it's about the march being involved so you know even when we were pitching this we said to the march please take ownership of this because you know it's a university initiative but the march has to take ownership because you know we don't want to be this to be seen as just some sort of project or research this is actually something that can make a difference to people's lives so this was pictures from the launch um great crowd at it farmers engaged um, we we really were delighted with the launch um, we had politicians, we had social media influencers in farming, and um, yeah, the, the launch went very well. Um, and even of young and old were in attendance. So it was just a really, it was a real positive step. I think we saw the potential straight away. And we learned a lot, even from, as Neve would probably agree, we learned a lot even from the first night about how to improve for the second night and thereafter. So it's a constantly uh, learning as we went along. Um, we also held, a, you know, for this, we had to think about, you know, what the farmers want to do, what they're interested in. So we held a, a stock judging competition every evening where uh, farmers came around and they, they could guess the best, what they thought would be the best, um, highest priced pin. And there's no such thing as the healthy competition amongst farmers is a great thing. There was a bit of competitiveness, um, you know, joking and laughing who got the best one week, who got the best the next week. It just added to it. It just added another layer of fun, enjoyment. This is what this is about. Like, of course, this can address loneliness. It can address social isolation. But but it's we 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 pitched it as a, a social get together, and the knock on effects of this are addressing the more complicated issues essentially. So you know, this was um, we you know every evening this was laid out near the pins where the cattle were. Farmers just came along. Um, you know, this, the week one winner was Miriam Hastings, a young farmer from um, near Valley Forn. 
Uh, great to see her winning. Um, she's a social media influencer as well. Just it all, it was great. It was, you know, they won. We had canteen vouchers for the winners and the cup will be presented as the overall winner on Friday. But Maneve and I can't announce that just yet, but uh, that's going to be presented on Friday. But uh, again, just another element to it. But I suppose most importantly, um, we found that, you know, each of the weeks we held different topics. So the first week was on the cattle breeding, next week health and well-being, mark, online mark bidding. So you can see, I'm not going to read them all out, but I'll go through one of them one by one now in a moment. But it's really just to showcase that we try to, um, you know, essentially communicate, try and pitch this to farmers in something that they'd be interested in. This is like it's something of interest. So the first week it was uh, Chris Daly from the ICBF, a really big national body for cattle breeding. He came and talked about Eurostar and breeding indexes with a great turnout of farmers. That was at the launch, really successful. Um, and from that, there was actually a lot of media coverage. So I was on RT Radio one one morning speaking about it. Farmers, farmers Journal picked up on it. Go Bay. All these platforms picked up on it. So again, it just enhanced the reputation of uh, this and really kind of legitimized that this actually has potential um, moving forward. The next evening was looking after your health and well-being. E. Clark, chairperson of Galway GA's Health and Wellness Committee, um, to speak to farmers. Um, I, I just wanted to put up this um, to showcase why it was important um, to address this topic. You know, and farming is always, you know, it's always spoken about that it's the most dangerous of occupations in, in terms of um, fatalities and accidents. But unfortunately, uh, when you look at uh, deaths by suicide and self-harm from the CSO data, actually year on year, it's almost higher. So farming is one of the most dangerous occupations, but unfortunately, um, the numbers are higher in relation to suicide and self-harm. So it's and that was a source from Marky 2022. Um, she worked uh, professor working in University College Dublin Ag um, School. Um, just wanted to put it up there to showcase why it's so important to bring about social inclusion and tackle loneliness um, and bring about social you know, inclusion. So, you know, essentially this farmer's yard initiative has the potential to contribute to the farmer's overall sense of happiness and belonging, self-worth. In a farming context, particularly in miss the gradual decline of their physical capabilities, capacities as they age, farmers have been used to working physically all their life. And as they age, it has to be a struggle, as with everyone. But, you know, farmers yards bringing farmers of a similar stage of their life together, you know, they can talk, they can just share concerns, even if it's just a complaint to each other, it's still bringing them together. Um, and it allows them to to remain actively involved in the farming community. It's it's not just, it's a way of life, not just an occupation. And retirement actually puts it at risk in that sense. And it's also very important for those living alone or those who may not have a successor in situ to take over the farm, that they have this. So the next night uh, we had online MART bidding discussion, um, GRETB and Maria Egan was there, uh, was brilliant, really engaged with the farmers. Um, you know, and a lot of these farmers are older farmers who may not have been as knowledgeable about it, but hopefully, and they have services for computer courses. So, you know, it's all about just kind of exposing them to it and then they can decide for themselves. You know, we weren't enforcing this on anyone. It was just, this, it was these conversations were here. So the, the following night was, was great success again, a free health check. Um, a lot of farmers almost like snuck in the back door to get their free health check. They didn't want to see their peers get, they didn't really... It was a funny just to observe them on the evening, but um, it was a good turnout. Some of them did pause for a vote, fair, fair enough. But uh, um, so, but uh, yeah, we, we had the Cree, which is Ireland's uh, health and heart, West of Ireland's health and heart charity, were there to do this with the farmers uh, throughout the march. So, you know, the, the, I don't know that I mentioned that, but the farmer's yards runs alongside the evening that the mart is taking place. So the evening that the cattle are taking place, the farmer's yards runs alongside it. So we actually didn't, we promoted it, but we farmers were coming to the mart anyways. They were coming regardless. So it's about um, really capturing them and showing them that, well, the mart plays this social role. It, take ownership of it. You know, this is what farmers yards, essentially the pilot was to prove to them, prove to the mart, this can work. So the following evening, um, it was really good as well to have um, 
Land Mobility Ireland there. They're a service um, market and firm initiative looking at farm partnerships and contract rearing. So this actually brought the younger and the older farmer together to discuss the future of uh, farm partnerships, succession, um, et cetera. Um, I suppose from my own perspective, the, the foundations of the PhD were based on this. So I was you know, personally happy to, to have them here. Um, and again, Galway Bay FM, Sally Ann Barrett, a journalist with them. Uh, she was brilliant. She actually did a, an interview and Maura spoke on it uh, as well as some of the farmers in attendance. So um, again, it just showcased that, um, you know, there was support from the media in relation to this throughout. And then the final evening uh, just gone, it was held on, on the April 21st. Uh, Pat Griffin, Senior Inspector for Agriculture at the uh, HSA was there to speak to farmers about um, health and safety. A very engaging conversation again. Um, you know, when we look at this, 66% of farm deaths in 2019 were over the age of 60, 60 and over. Um, I won't go into all this, but it's one of the most hazardous occupations. Um, so, yeah. Farmers Yards provided the HSA with a platform to directly engage with these farmers. And that's that was a success in itself. Um, we have social media presence. Uh, it's growing and growing. So uh, if you ever want to check it out, uh, it's worth uh, just following the updates. Um, you know, I think uh, hopefully you can see the top of that slide. But, you know, it's up to the Marts now to really take ownership of this and to promote themselves as, as venues of social interaction, not just places to buy and sell animals. We, we really feel that the Marts have a big role in this moving forward. And you only need to look at this map. This map was produced by AgriLand around COVID just to show what marts were closed and what marts were open. But as you can see, they are absolutely across the whole country, these marts. They all, every one of these marts, regardless of where, what corner of Ireland, will have farmers attending these on just in a social capacity. And hypothetically, if you could have a farmer's yard social group in each of these, it would help bring about some social inclusion and tackle loneliness in farming. Uh, I have no doubt about that, but it just needs a body or an entity to, to bring this forward. And perhaps the Marts as a collective, they can achieve this. So I'm not gonna go into the, I just wanted to kind of give a few slides here just to show that, okay, nationally, you know, a lot of potential, but this policy relevant action oriented research is really important because this isn't just an Ireland problem, it's across Europe and globally. Uh, I was involved in the farm trans, I'm leading this from an Irish perspective, but it's there's over 17,000 farmers across the world involved in this. Um, in Ireland, I, we did it in uh, 2014 and in Iowa, the US, so this, these are the states in the US it was done in. So really the questions that I carried out from an Irish perspective, I compared them with uh, data from Iowa, USA, and I'm sure a lot of you might have almost Iowa is like the heart of agriculture in the US. Uh, that's the state there, Central America, massive farms. You can even see Ireland just fits into it almost. So you're talking, so the average farm size in Ireland's 80 acres, Iowa 359, even farming systems, it's almost chalk and cheese. So you would first, you would first get, you would almost, oh, well, we're not like them. That's a completely different world. But interestingly, when I compare the Iowa and Irish data in relation to patterns of rates of succession retirement, there was a lot of similarities. Um, and I can I, I did publish this in Iowa State University's Agricultural Policy Review. You know, this is the data compared side by side with Iowa and Ireland. Like when you think about the difference in scale of farms, the difference in systems, you're it's a really really um uh you know like this whole notion of retirement and sending retirement it's the blue that you need to look at those that intend to fully retire only a quarter in each and i think that's i, I used to use this it's not as applicable now because prince charles is now king charles but when i was uh, be it teaching or presentations I would always say it's that, you know, farmers aren't retiring. Just think about the younger generation. The, the, back in 1996, it was referred to as the Prince Charles syndrome. Essentially, uh, in a farming context, think about it. There could be a farmer in their 60s, but still they're not the boss, just as Charles wasn't most of his life. So in a lot of cases, you know, farmers could be in that position. And 
you know, who's to say? So it's just to think about it, that the younger generation, are they willing to wait as long? Are they willing to, you know, to be the second in command? It's, it's concerning in that sense, because ironically, again, to look at this, you know, they, they, they do, there, there is this notion that, oh, well, there's, where are the successors, the younger generation? But actually, this is a nationally representative sample of farmers. You know, this isn't just a small, over half of Irish farmers surveyed said, yeah, I've identified a successor. But if they're not going to retire and also they don't have a will in place, they have no succession plan in place, it's chaotic. So it's just a note of caution about these, this topic. So, you know, that uh, what I've talked about here, it's not about a one size fits all for solving this. But I think this human side of the process is essential to look at moving forward. And thankfully, you know, the US have been very supportive of this. And it actually was a, an eye opener to me that it was so applicable there. And I'm actually giving a talk on this topic um, for this International Farm Transition Network there. It's coming out of South Dakota State University next month. So, so overall, you know, policy needs to be more concerned with the health and well-being of older farmers and adapt to their needs. I think that the research and farmers' yards can inform future policy directions to understand the world as farmers perceive it, and as a consequence, prevent them from being isolated and exclu excluded from society. And I would almost say, like, I'm not saying that the Department of Agriculture wanted to exclude them or, or make them isolated, but it was almost by accident rather than intention. The intentions were that, you know, we need the younger generation, so come on, come on, please retire and facilitate that. But there's actually much more... There's many layers to this that, that need to be taken into account. So hopefully the research, the farmer's yards can give these older farmers a voice. Um, I, I also like to just put this slide up. It's a it's a short clip. You can find it on YouTube. But again, it's about a farmer in America. But uh, you look at this and we'll all know a farmer like this. And we can all, it's only, I think, 14 minutes. But I, So yeah, um, that's a journey of research. Um, I always quote John B. Cain as well. Again, just look at the date that was written, 1965. Again, a lot of farmers think that way. Uh, they, they, that's the still instilled uh, in the farming mindset. So, uh, thanks a million for your attention. Excellent, Shane. Well done. Well done. A great, um, a great monologue, really, of all of the years of research, and uh, I, I think it's. It's excellent just to see how that research can form a practical idea, um, you know, in and around how to disseminate that research at the end of the day and how to um, format an idea in and around how we can, I suppose, change and bring policy to, I suppose, that kind of practice. So Shane, well done in relation to all of that. And thanks a million. Um, I think we have a couple of comments in relation to um, here. We don't have a lot of time, but we do have some comments already. Paul has put in there again, complimenting the research. And he was about to ask about um, a comparability outside of Ireland. But Shane, you have fairly well covered that in relation to the US. And Helen, who is with us as well, um, again, complimenting the research and uh, I suppose suggesting that the presentation is presented to the Green Cert students, which would be a great idea as well. Helen, happy for you to pop in on that if you want mm. to, which is a good yeah, idea. Yeah, con huge congratulations, Shane. Um, really interesting. I, I, I particularly liked um, the way that your research has informed policy and the community and, and absolutely congratulations to you. Um, and yes, the green cert, um, because that's uh, relevant to to home here. And I think if, if yeah. my my son was being, you know, he's doing the green cert and uh, by goodness, uh, it's very informative. Could I ask a question on that? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not in there. The green cert, but um, on the research, um, I noticed all your pictures were male. And I'm just wondering, was there any responses from from females? And did you see a difference? Um, yeah. It may not be relevant, but just interested on that. Do, do you mean the pictures from the farmers' yards? No, no, before that, but right through the. the well, the, there, there are there. I, I, I'm, I can stand by that. There's women throughout the presentation in the pictures. Like there's, there's more men. 
but there's more men there are but uh, there's women that wasn't a criticism yeah. more about the, the difference i suppose yeah it, well it's interesting in, in because i of the demographic of the research participants i'll just give you one example there was a woman i interviewed uh she was in her 80s but she she her husband had passed away so i asked her questions like what's the farm mean to you and she said something along the lines of well when you asked me what the farm means to me, she said, I can associate when my husband and I, my late husband and I got married. She said, I can associate the development of the farm through the years with the way our, our marriage and our kids have grown up. And to me, it was just, I was just like, it was very emotional. And she did get a little bit upset. But to me, it was like, well, this woman is equally as invested in this farm as her husband was. You know, we do have, and luckily within what we're doing now, we're that new Falera project, female aid innovation, agriculture and rural areas, we're looking at those roles. Like in a lot of cases, women have a, a very, very central role. I even see it in my own house at home here, my mom and dad, like they, they play that role, but maybe not as recognized. So yeah, of course, predominantly it was mostly the men that were, that, that were, but when I actually went to interview, it was the women who, who often stepped up to speak because they were the ones who almost were the boss and essentially. So they play that role, but not recognized enough. And hopefully our research uh, can, can make an impact in that. And just, I really just go back to what you said about the green cert. It's actually, it's, it, I actually, uh, in some of my papers, I advocated that, that the green cert are modules in, in ag colleges should include succession planning as a, as a mandatory criteria. Because it's such a taboo topic, if you can bring it into education, it's almost the done thing to do. So at 18 or 19 or 20, you have to sit down at home with mother father and go, oh, listen, I have an assignment to do. We have to draw up a succession plan of what's happening in the farm. At least you're dressing that a little bit earlier on than when it gets out of control when you're in your late 30s and it's completely. So it's, it, yeah, I agree completely. I think that the, it, the, the green cert this needs to be incorporated in some way because financially, you know, the facts and the figures, it's fine. But we all know that, you know, there's such emotion attached to this that uh, there needs to be, it needs to be looked at in greater detail. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I agree completely. Great, Shane. Thanks a million. Shane, if you don't mind, I might just ask Neve to pop in and maybe just, Neve, give us a very quick kind of idea. You were played a huge role in coordinating the project on the ground over the last few weeks. So maybe, you know, even a, a kind of a learning from you, Neve, what would you think? What was your takeaway yeah, message? From um, the whole thing? As Shane like touched on as well throughout his presentation, there was an awful lot of learnings we had each night. So even just trying to get the talks, the time frame of that correct and that suited the farmers, not wasn't going to take place during the market that had come after the time frame. But also, I suppose, the time of year as well, the, the evenings got longer on us. So I think that in the back end would be probably better again. Um, the engagement from the farmers was absolutely unbelievable. The farmers, they bring along people every week. The competition really got them talking. And as Shane said in his presentation as well, that you know, what else to get farmers in, involved in, in the competition itself. So there's great engagement in the competition once they got familiarised with us, uh, what we do in the canteen. It just became more comfortable for them. And even when they had a cup of tea, they got to chat with their peers, have that conversation, whether it was about the farm or the lo local gossip, they're exchanging that information with each other. So, um, yeah, there was an awful lot of insights we found over the past six weeks. And it was interesting to see the different farmers come along of all generations as well and from different farming enterprises itself. So, yeah, yeah. it was great. It was great, great on the ground. Yeah. And just to add to what Neve was saying, um, a big part of it as well is that the march got so into this, like the staff within the march were really excited about this. And, you know, of course, like with anything and funding limits with research, you know, there, there was a six week pilot, but they want to continue this. And, you know, we can play an advisory role from here on out, but, um, you know, the onus is on them now, but there's been a really positive response from Montbelli Merit and also surrounding Merits, because I suppose there's an element of competition as well. I won't name names in relation to what Merits are kind of wondering, well, what about us? But it is happening and that's what we were hoping to achieve. So, you know, the, the ideal thing would be that if they could cluster you know, keep building this, um, you know, maybe roll it out elsewhere. I do know that there's between, again, probably it's so provisional, I can't name names, but in the UK, there's a certain um, organization looking at this as well that 
are thinking about it because this is a this is a model that's pretty universal as my research has proven and you know the logo is there the branding is there it really can be picked up you know we 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 have the general ethos vision but people can adapt it as they require the, the, the main thing is it's a social outlet for farmers that's the fundamental part of this they can address well-being they can address whatever the way they want but this is a social get together so um so yeah great shane thanks on that i just wonder is there anybody else to come in and watch on the clock as well as we always do with the rural voices michael you want to pop in there and brian leonard there is raising his hand as well i think Brian as well good okay yeah. we'll go to michael there and then i'll go to brian michael we just get you off um mute Michael, we just we can't hear you there. You're on mute. I think I have it on done this time. Great. Great. Thanks, Michael. With the help of the younger generation here. But um, anyway, um, no, I just uh, could, because I'm from Leitrim and uh, we have five marts in Leitrim. Some of the worst land and some of the most marts. And uh, I'm actually involved myself in um, a committee that's spearheaded by Leitrim County Council. It's um, an SLAG group, it's called. And, you know, we've been looking for some time. There's some funding available. And I, I just think that, but there's one practical question I have. Um, what sort of facilities had the marts if, if you know, you needed that? Had they a room? Had they, you know, the, some of your marts? The canteen, that was, that was canteen. all we needed. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. just on a practical yeah. level. Yeah. Okay. No, but if, if if you're interested in it, you can get in touch. If Leitrim want to roll out a version of it, it's it'll be yeah, it'll be great. Well, I'll make contact with you because um we're having particular meetings and so on, and I might mention your name, Shane. Okay. Is that no, okay? That's perfect, Michael. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent, Michael. That would be great. Thanks. Um, I'll go to Brian. Hello there. Um, thanks very much, Shane. Um, I was I was very interested to see how this this worked. So it's it's really good to see, especially from from being a researcher, it's great to see the research actually making an impact to actual farmers. And um, so that's that's excellent. And um, also, Michael, I empathise with you. I'm from Sligo, and I'd say we have the second worst land in the country. Good cattle, um, though. Good cattle. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shane, in terms of, I was very interested to know about the um, the level of actual interaction between farmers. So you had the talk. Did you find it difficult to actually get farmers to talk to each other? You know, the usual kind of marked folded arms looking around or or did they actually embrace the, the social side? Yeah, well, I, I suppose that because we use the facilities of the canteen, um, that was the almost the focal point. And we had the Neve and I had the table set up that, the, the, you know, we had them kind of looped around each other so there was always like we, we we did lay out the room according to like you know trying to bring them together yeah and there was farmers there that were catching up with each other that mightn't have talked before we had some uh, farmers from other uh, from us common from different areas that mightn't have known each other and because there was this sort of a feeling that well this is a little bit more than just a normal day at the mart that there's a bit of a social outlet we had like complimentary uh, tea and sandwiches uh, for them as well that was every evening so you know it just brought them in i think that was like to, to bring them in all well, this free we gave them vouchers around the mart well there's free tea and coffee and sandwiches and they were delighted to come in then so you know yeah of course there was a bit of carrot there to, to bring them in but yeah you'd always have you know the farmers farmers but generally speaking we found it a very warm atmosphere and Maura probably was there plenty of evenings as well. There was plenty of conversations and chats and the, the conversation at the end, these present, these gift, these, excuse me, these guest speakers were an add on. Actually, in hindsight, we probably didn't even need them. I know that, that that's no disrespect to the speakers, but actually with the, the value of bringing the farmers together in a kind of a more structured manner for social inclusion, that's what we wanted. And the speakers were a really nice add on. But we, we, we can, I suppose, we after a finding, we need to drop an evaluation. We actually can say that, well, the guest speakers could happen once a month. It doesn't have to happen every evening because these farmers are just happy to get together. The stock judging, again, doesn't have to happen, but it was a nice add-on. It was worth trying it. Uh, as you know, Brian, you have farming as well. It's a nice bit of competition. So um, 
yeah, we, we need to evaluate this properly, but it only ended Friday. So we but overall very happy with it. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose what Shane has outlined there is the diversity of what can actually happen if you are interested in rolling out the group. I think that's what's most interesting. Um, there's no one model that might work for this, but I think having the brand that Shane has created in and around this, I think is is something that you can your you know hit your wagon to anywhere, be it the mart or somewhere else. I think it's a it's a great model of putting policy and research into practice, and I think that's what has been so successful about this whole thing. Um, so I suppose on that, um, you, you know, again, Shane will have um, the presentations a lot. All of the presentations we do every week, they go up on the YouTube channel. And over the space of the next couple of weeks, you'll get the link to the YouTube channel. So please log on to that if you want to kind of listen again or listen back to any of the um seminars that we've had over the last number of weeks. All of the seminars are related to rural um, research, rural interests, rural aspects, rural issues that are happening on the ground. And they happen at the end of the month. So one particularly possibly a Wednesday, but we do alter uh, sometimes the days depending on the speakers. But uh, at the end, the last week on every month. So please join us if you are interested in any kind of rural issues, um, particularly related to rural Ireland, but also international as well. I put a link in there. Shane mentioned the Falara project, which is a new project we're leading in Galway, a European project related to female-led innovation in agriculture and rural areas. And hopefully as um, the months pass, we'll get an opportunity to um, present that research as well via the um, Rural Voices Seminar Series. But for today, not to delay you and go over time, again, I want to thank Shane and say congratulations and well done. A, a super initiative as a result of some great research. Thanks to Neve for assisting Shane in relation to the farmer's yards. And uh, most definitely thanks to all of you for joining us again today. And hopefully we'll see you towards the end of next month. Thanks a million. Bye to everybody. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.